of some admin. Um, so welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining. This is a training session ahead of the local elections in May to hopefully give you a sense of how we'll be approaching them from our side, our policies, and also how you can make the most of your YouTube presence, both for that campaign period and beyond. So some housekeeping points, first of all, you know, we want to make this session as interactive as possible. So feel free to post questions in the chat as we go along. If you want to post a question anonymously, a really useful thing that you can use is the Q&A function. And I didn't know about this, but basically you can access the Q&A through those three shapes bottom right in your screen, a square, a triangle and a circle. And if you click on those, there's a Q&A option and you can post something in there. I'll be monitoring that as we go along. We'll either try to address uh, questions as we go along or we will also leave some time for them at the end. Um, and then the other main thing just to point out is that we're going to be recording this session and hosting it online publicly afterwards. And that's important so that we can make sure that everyone is able to access this election support from an equity perspective. So um, the final thing to say is, you know, luckily it won't just be me for this entire presentation. I will be handing over to some lovely other speakers as well. Um, but just to introduce myself, I'm Stella, for those of you I haven't met. So I manage civics partnerships here at YouTube, working with political parties, but also government on making the most of, of YouTube from an organic perspective. And the main things that we're hoping to cover with you this week, this session, um, and if you come away from this session with anything, we'd love you to come away with these three points. So. First of all, understanding our responsibility framework, and these are our own always on efforts to ensure a responsible platform, um, including new requirements around AI generated content, um, as well as specific election policies and efforts that we do. Secondly, from your perspective, you know how you can make the most of YouTube as um, building your channel as an election hub in the run up to the campaign and afterwards. And then finally, understanding the rules of the road, both around community guidelines, copyright and ad friendly guidelines. So how we enforce these and also what you can do if you have an issue, how you can get in touch with us. So without further ado, I will hand over to Ian, who is our head of policy for UK and Ireland to talk about our responsibility framework. Thanks, Stella. And hi, everyone. Uh, as Stella just said, I'm Ian. I, I lead policy here at YouTube. And so what I'm going to talk to you about today is that responsibility network, uh, framework, or the four R's, as we call it. Um, this is how we handle harmful content across the platform and uh, something we, we use all times around. But we're very conscious in this year, a year of global elections with major challenges, that we have to make sure we have the policies and processes in place and consider what particular issues might crop up in the next six weeks as you're preparing for those local elections. So I'm going to go through these in, in detail. It's uh, the four R's. But before we begin, I just want to introduce the high level point, which is what we seek to do with potentially harmful content is remove content that violates our community guidelines, including election content, raise high quality election news and information from authoritative sources, reduce the spread of harmful uh, misinformation, uh, and reward trusted creators via the YouTube Partner Programme. And I will go through each of those in turn, but the point that I want everyone to take away is that our policies apply to everyone and enforce with consistency, regardless of political viewpoints expressed, the language and the content, or how content is generated. So let's look at remove. As I mentioned, remove is, is a part of um, a huge focus of YouTube and the trust and safety pro, uh, programs and processes we put in place. A lot of people look at our, how our community guidelines are drafted and think very carefully and yeah, and with high scrutiny about how we what content we, we choose to remove. In election year, that's going to be even more important. Um, and we obviously have long standing community guidelines that apply to election related content. Some of the uh, verticals we think will be most uh, relevant here during uh, during the the uh, local elections, but also thinking ahead to any general uh, are those around harassment, uh, content that threatens individuals such as election workers or candidates or um, or voters that isn't allowed under our harassment, harassment and cyberbullying policies. We'll see that a lot in, co in comments in particular, potentially. Our hate speech policy, that's uh, that covers content that promotes violence or hatred against individuals or, or groups based on certain uh, attributes. That content isn't allowed on YouTube whatsoever. 
of course, misinformation is something we see a lot during uh, elections as as various different individuals and, and sometimes um, organized groups seek to uh, either upload manipulated content, content that um, is doctored or in some ways seeking to mislead users or misattributed content. So that's content that may pose a serious risk of, of egregious harm by falsely claiming, for example, old footage from a past event is, is a current event. Uh, we've seen a lot of that uh, at the start of the Israel-Palestine conflict, for example, misattributed content. And we could see other attempts to pr perhaps uh, show ballot box uh, rigging from other, other territories, etc. We're very alive to those risks and we're looking to make sure we've got a full process in place. Um, finally, uh, violent or graphic content, content encourages, that is content encourages others to commit violent acts, including acts targeting election workers or candidates. Um, isn't allowed, and obviously was, is content that we would we would, we would remove on our, uh, under our policy area. So we also have specific content that's related to elections. Uh, impersonation policy includes the, giving us the policy coverage to remove any any videos or co or comments. In fact, that that are intended to impersonate a personal channel. We see that as a particular risk for for, for candidates, or and so if you're seeing councillors or council candidates um, being uh, being impersonated, you know, please do flag that. That's really important. We may not have that information uh, from our trust and safety team to understand it, but if you're able to help us find that content, that's super helpful uh, and will at lead us to be able to move quickly and, and uh, ensure that voters are well informed. Our spam inspective, uh, our spam deceptive practices and scams policy also ensures that we're prohibiting misleading content meant to take advantage of YouTube users. And I think um, deceptive practices can be can be very wide in, a, in election content. Um, and then finally, our external links policy. This is when you're thinking about um, clickable URLs or verbally directing users to sites or videos um, that are not, the video the video or the, the link itself is not prohibitive, but the content it's driving people towards is. And so don't just think about the content you're seeing on YouTube. We think about those external links and make sure we're, we're considering, for example, uh, content that may be a misleading or deceptive content relating to the election or, or hate speech. Uh, beyond that, we have specific process uh, policies about voter suppression, candidate eligibility and incitement to interfere with democratic processes. Uh, the voter suppression one I think is really important. Um, we're very concerned about uh, about voters understanding what's going on with the elections. Obviously, one of the first elections we're holding in the UK uh, where voter ID requirements that are, are going to be uh, needed. And it's, it's important that, for example, we don't see any false claims that could materially discourage voting. Um, I think that's a that's a risk that we are very actively considering. Um, other things we've seen in other markets are things like fake methods, uh, telling people they can text their vote to a particular number, obviously not allowed in, in the UK Electoral Commission law and the sort of thing that we need to be alive to. Again, if you see any of this sort of content, we want to, we'd love you to share it with us because you may see it before our trust and safety systems catch it. Um, although we are always looking for to, to enforce these things. Um, finally, on uh, on in, uh, incitement to interfere with democratic processes, um, there is, of course, we are very alive to the risk of, of electoral disinformation, uh, works by um, by uh, state like actors to uh, interfere with elections. We think things like the mayoral campaigns in certain mar in certain cities could could very well be uh, done that. And recently, uh, our colleagues at the Google owned Mandiant. Um, Analysis Group released a, a a very important paper, which I'd encourage people to leave to read about the potential threats uh, across the these the, the coming global election year. Uh, we're we're alive to that, and we're approaching it. I would like to uh, assure people that we see that as something that we will address. But of course, if you have anything you might you might have signals or suspicious of of a potential demo, uh, incitement to interfere with democratic processes, come to us through the through the flagging route that we'll talk about later. And of course, and as Stella mentioned, for the first time, uh, this will be a, sort of the first Gen AI election, I guess. And we're thinking very carefully about what that means at YouTube. Our commitment to to uh, uh, AI is all about being both bold and responsible. Bold because we think that AI can have a massive, um, fantastic impact on the creative industries. Uh, it can help us go to the next stage of human made human made creativity. Um, and also, I think even in sort of election campaigns, you can have a lot of fun with this stuff, right? But what's really important and why we have to act responsible is that people need to not be misled. And so what we've introduced recently is a, um, uh, a new disclosure, actually just launched in the last couple of weeks, 
which means that creators are, are responsible for labeling their content um, as being generated by AI. Um, and this synthetic content policy, as you can see, it will show very clearly to the user whether they're watching it on their phone or on a, on a or laptop. Um, that will be very clear to them that, that they, uh, this is being generated by it. That we feel is the right balance at this stage to better inform viewers when the content they're seeing it, it, they're watching is altered or synthetic. Um, and we are rolling that out uh, you know, across the UK. So if you see something, or also, of course, in, for campaign teams, if you upload something that is using generative AI, make sure you click that box and make sure that you are um, you are ensuring viewers are, are aware of that, that that has been that has been altered. Next raise. So we just talked about the remove, and I think there's a there's a, for very good reasons a lot of scrutiny on YouTube and the remove um, uh, pillar. But actually, informing voters is so critical to what we do as a platform, and uh, and so raising authoritative sources, um, including election information, is really important in any election cycle. The main ways we do that is through um, uh, raising news content, news and authoritative sources. And I think during election period, we'll see a lot of commentary, a lot of features of principles, you know, the likes of you know, Keir Starmer and, and Rishi Sunak of this world doing visits. It's so so important that the top uh, hits you get on YouTube search or in recommended systems are from authoritative partners. And for that, we use a um, number of signals to determine authoritativeness, including the, the relevance and freshness of the content and the expertise of the source. We also use external raters and experts to provide um, critical input and guidance on the accuracy of those videos. And what we try and do, therefore, is make sure that users are left with the most relevant election information. Why that matters for campaign teams, of course, is that sometimes that means on, on a big breaking news story, you, your, your own content may actually not be at what, comes up, what comes up top. It will be the news sources, the reporting of that. Um, we recognize that that, has a, that is a trade off that we need to make. But overall, I think that what it leaves it is that voters will be best informed by the authoritative sources across the board. And that's the right balance in terms of raising authoritative content. We're also uh, alive to the, the risk of harmful mi election misinformation. Um, where accuracy and authoritativeness are key, we need to reduce the spread of content that's not violating our policies, may, may seek to misinform users in a harmful way. The reduce pillar is something that we've developed over time, partly because we've seen um, you know, certain bad actors start to gamify our, our, our community guidelines, start to learn what works and what doesn't, see the word, see the, uh, the, the videos that are, are flagged and those that are, those that are, uh, are allowed to stay up. You know, when we see those bad actors, you know, we can't expand our policy coverage because, you know, our policies are, are enforced consistently. But we can see, you know, we can already have this ability to, to take them out of our our, um, our recommendation system so they don't show up on um, prominently in search results or, or in up next, for example. So in reduce, what we try and do is um, look at uh, using external evaluators primary input just in the way that they are, they're advisors on what's authoritative. They also advisors on those things that are the exact opposite, these, these borderline misinfo. Um, and whilst uh, we base that on consensus, we use machine learning systems to build models in order to scale our efforts and really limit the spread of content over time. Um, as always, people can still access all these videos that, com that, that comply with our community guidelines. Um, but we think this strikes the right balance between maintaining, maintaining free speech, but also living up to the responsibility that our users uh, have and so the balance of raise and reduce mean that uh, at all times we're trying to seek and, and will be so important over these next six weeks uh, this uh, the most informed users user base we can if you see stuff please do let us know and we can see whether it's violating our policies or potentially a borderline content uh, we can get our our content moderators to take a look at that now finally when we talk about the four r's we, we also talk about reward uh, and that's about um the unique revenue sharing platform that YouTube is. You know, it's really important that we uh, we allow all these businesses to grow on YouTube, over 2 billion, um, uh, business, two billion pounds economic impact and over 45,000 jobs in the UK are, are thanks to YouTube's revenue sharing model. What that also means though, is that monetization is a right, not a privilege. And we set a higher bar for the content that we do, that we do reward. Uh, and we have, so we have an additional set of policies over the community guidelines that we talked about earlier um, that have it that have impacts during an election campaign. Um, why that is is because well, well, because it's the right thing to do, but also frankly, because 
our, our revenue sharing model means that it's not just that the revenue goes to the creators it also goes to youtube so we're we are also benefiting from that content so it's a, absolutely appropriate that we work with the creators to make sure that there is a higher bar and that the content that can be monetized has a um, you know, has a, is uh, appropriate and, and frankly brand safe one of the challenges we've seen in the past of course is um is that many advertisers don't want to be next to controversial content and so that's why on the um uh, that's why we have a series of Google Ads policies that come together with the YouTube policies to ensure a safe, positive experience for uh, for, for the whole ecosystem. Um, that includes political content, and I think if we look at the next slide, um, there are a whole bunch of parameters uh, for monetization that you know. It says here, for example, adult content. As you should be aware, YouTube has never allowed porn. It's never been something that's that our platform wants to have. But we have a higher bar still for. Adult, adult themes or uh, and content that can monetize. Um, that is going to be uh, hopefully not be very relevant during an election campaign, but I think it's more just as an example of the work and uh, and approach that we take across these four R's to ensure that um, to ensure that creators are aware of their obligations and are only able to monetize, and YouTube is only able to monetize um, uh, the the most appropriate content. That that uh, also means that you've got these higher pieces. I think I've sort of covered this slide, but. We have the next point. I think where that may come across in in some of the some of the work you're doing is it also fits into our copyright framework. So, uh, as as uh, campaign teams and and individuals who are uh, camp who are involved in the election, you may find that you are uploading content that actually uh, is owned by has yeah for example a music track or something else that has um, that is owned by others. If that's the case, um, you may. Uh, you may uh, be asked to uh, notify. Uh, we, off we offer rights holders the chance to claim all copyright on their content. They can either block it or they can monetize it. Um, I think for campaign teams, the biggest issue would be if someone is monetizing it, suddenly adverts are appearing on your on your content. So that's something you want to be aware of. Um, obviously, if you see the copyright strike, you can use the resolution options on there. It's all through your YouTube studio and very easy to, to, to do. Similarly, if you're seeing someone use your content, you can file a copyright strike. And that's something that, that our partner support team can help you with as well. If you're concerned that someone, for example, is using footage from from, uh, from your own um, sort of filming. And with that, I think I'm gonna uh, pass over to Stella to talk about the uh, about what we're doing particularly to, and what some of the tips and tricks that we can use to to, uh, to get the most out of the campaign system on, in our, in, within that responsible framework. Thank you, Ian. And that was so perfectly to time. Um, so, uh, yeah, as Ian said, I'm going to be talking about, you know, how you can really maximize and make the most of YouTube, um, not just, you know, running up to the campaign period, but also beyond. And I think the important thing here is it's really about approaching this from a long term perspective. We all know that building a YouTube channel and an audience takes time. So this is, you know, not what will necessarily win you an election, but it will is what absolutely will help you build a loyal and sustained audience uh, that is engaged with you for the election and beyond. Um, you will also be pleased to know that there are some quick and easy wins which we'll be sharing with you. So first up, a really good framework that we like to use um, that is quite useful for understanding both how to categorize and schedule different types of content, but also understanding what different types of content are going to do for your channel. And that's called Hero Hub and Help. So starting with hero content, this is your, you know, higher production value, more mass appeal content. So it's going to be less frequent, you know, it might be monthly, it may well be less frequent than that time to major events. This could be, say, a hero speech of a political figure, it could be coverage of a major national event. Um, it could be a creator collaboration, a piece of content that you've put more, um, more effort into producing. And this is going to be hopefully something that the recommendation system recognizes has broad appeal, will recommend to relevant audiences and, and help put your channel in front of those new audiences. Then of course, those viewers need something to watch between your hero moments. And so that's where your hub content comes in. This is your regular drumbeat of content that is keeping your channel refreshed and keeping audiences coming back to your channel. So, you know, this could be at the beginning, you know, maybe one short a week, building to one VOD and two shorts a week. But the key is that hub content is 
episodic content that you can batch shoot and schedule in advance. And then finally, help content. So this uh, is potentially less planned content that you put out in response to the news cycle. So, you know, it might be that something comes up one week that you want to respond to, you want to give your opinion on, or you see that there's a particular area, say, of potentially, you know, confusion around the election or, or misinformation that you really want to help clarify. And so help content um, can be content that you put out then in response to that. Short form is great for help content because it is easy to produce um, and, and much quicker to get out so that, so that it can stay topical. We always get the question, you know, how much, how frequently should I be uploading to the channel? And the answer is schedule content based on what is achievable for you and your resources and workload. And then as far as possible, stick to that. What the recommendation system favors is consistency over volume. So it's absolutely not the case that you need to be putting out content every day. You know, the beauty of YouTube is that we are the second largest search engine in the world and content has a really long lifespan on YouTube. What is much more important is to be thinking about what is a reliable and regular release schedule that you can um, plan and then stick to and deliver on weekly. YouTube is obviously a really multi-format platform. It's fantastic in that it gives you lots of different ways to engage with your audience. Some channels are exclusively shorts or predominantly live streaming, but all of them have different merits. And we really advocate where possible taking a multi-format approach from long form, to live streaming, which is obviously great for real time, you know, providing real time opinion and updates, but also that real time in audience engagement, you know, the ability to interact directly with your audience. Shorts, which Tabitha will come on to in a second alongside podcasting, but shorts, as we mentioned, really good low lift means of content creation. And also when you're thinking about, you know, how the majority of shorts are discovered in the shorts feed, it's a great way of reaching more passive audiences that aren't familiar with your channel, but nonetheless could be really interested in your content. And then within each of those formats, there are a bunch of sub formats. And these are sometimes helpful for thinking of new ideas for your elections coverage. And I just want to call out a couple here. Uh, and apologies that a couple of these thumbnails haven't seemed to load on screen. Um, but or no maybe they are which is fantastic and it's just our version so interviews uh really classic format but something important to think of here to avoid it being you know a bit stale and stuffy is how can you make that interview format more engaging maybe adding in a fun element or a challenge element behind the scenes really fantastic from a campaign perspective to think about how you can give your youtube audience something that they aren't able to get from broadcasters. So this could be fly on the wall coverage of an engagement, of a local visit. Explainers, really great because they are more evergreen. So ideally what you're aiming for here is a video that has a kind of a keyword driven, FAQ driven title that is going to be being recommended to users when they're searching for a topic in the months and years to come. Collaborations, finally, really helpful when you're thinking about growing a channel and maybe wanting to tap into a new or broader audience of an existing, more established channel. So you could think about options to co-create content with that other channel. A lot of people exercise because they believe it's wonderful to welcome you. Where all London. of the videos on screen try to play, but we've managed to glide seamlessly through it. <laughs> So finally, a note from me then on channel branding and appearance. And this is really about putting your best foot forward. So when people come to your channel, even if there isn't a ton of content on that channel, even if it's not a super established channel, really um, putting forward your your um, the best appearance possible. So key things to think about here are your channel banners and your channel avatar, you know, making them as professional as possible, but also cohesive with your other social media uh, presence. And then a great thing to do as well, if you haven't already, is to get your channel verified. You can do that through creator support. And that just gives you that nice tick um, of authority on your channel. 
titles and thumbnails we could talk for hours about best practices here but just first here to stress the importance of them obviously you know there are some really sleek looking thumbnails on youtube your thumbnails are competing against those and they are what make uh, viewers click through to your video or not so keeping your thumbnails as eye-catching uh, and polished as possible and making sure that your titles are where possible really trying to spark intrigue or curiosity in the viewer and you know as ever for these the best thing to do is look at other popular creator channels and see what they're doing and then finally a note on playlists um something you can do with your channel is organize your content into potentially a playlist for new viewers or your most popular content or group your content by themes and we also now have a really really new feature which is a for you playlist so this is a custom shelf uh, on your channel that you can either choose to add or remove or reposition you can choose to only feature content from say the last 12 months in this playlist but what the recommendation system does is curate content from your channel for a specific user so a great thing to think about using on your channel and as with all of this is really about building your personal presence and your channel as a destination landing page when people are searching for you on YouTube so with that i'm going to hand over to tabitha now for a deeper dive on different formats hi everyone um for those of you i haven't met my name's tabitha i look after operations in the uk for our civic and news partners so i think it's fair to say that youtube remains kind of the home for endless long format content but short form is increasingly important um, we need to keep in mind that they kind of um, have different purposes but neither is more or less important the other superior inferior um, there's a good interplay between both there so a really incredible statistic is that connected tv is youtube's fastest growing screen with over 700 million hours of daily watch time as of january 2022 um, so while we have on the one side that long form content, we also are seeing this explosion in, in short form content via YouTube Shorts. So I think it's useful to think of Shorts as a place to reach audiences you haven't yet on YouTube main. Um, shorts are incredibly easy to make, relatively low lift. Um, so it can make them make it a great place to try out kind of new concepts and potentially find those those new audiences. But it's useful to think about, you know, where where could shorts fit into your broader content strategy? And there's kind of three areas to think about here. So number one is that broad based content, you know, where you can create and share content that has a potential to appeal to a broad audience. Um, and it's a good idea to think about that those shorts for the to be standalone to be viewable standalone during the election period and then we have that experimental content that i already kind of um spoke about briefly it's a good place to try out new things and it's a kind of safe place to test that and finally think of shorts as kind of snackable as well so it's great for highlighting your most popular long form content um, and enticing viewers to click through to your main channel um, so there are a couple of really easy wins with shorts if you weren't using these features already. So number one, we have clip and trim, um, which is a, a feature that you can use in the YouTube app where you can go straight from your long form content, click a couple of buttons and you're creating a short already. Um, it's a really also good idea um, to think about how you can deploy your archive content you know do you have kind of evergreen educational content election explainers that you could repurpose into those short kind of educational um shorts thinking about going live um is also really important during the election period and especially for our news partners this is something that's super super important um but but definitely have a think about whether you know live streaming could work for you it's obviously has it has things you, you need to think about, but it allows you to kind of respond in real time um, and process kind of news and information along with your audience. And finally, just a few words on podcasting. Um, YouTube is now one of the most popular platforms for podcasts with a global audience of over 2 billion 
active users. Um, podcasts are a great great way to help you expand your reach. Um, and also great about podcasts is that they automatically feed into the YouTube Music app. Podcasts are incredibly easy to make. It's as little as uh, clicking an extra button when you upload a video, which will help it become a podcast. Um, so again, it could be a way to kind of engage your audience, um, drive more interest in your channel, and you know, utilize the analytics that you get through this new content avenue to inform your um, strategy more broadly moving forwards. And back to Stella now for some final words. Thanks so much, Tabitha. And just a reminder that we will be turning to you for any questions that you have. Um, so that scary moment uh, where we pause and ask for any questions. So if there is anything burning top of mind, uh, feel free to post it in the chat or the Q&A or to pop your hand up in a second. So just to review then what we've covered today, we talked about how we uphold a responsible platform and that's our four R's of remove, reduce, raise and reward. We also talked about how you can make the most of YouTube, building your channel, thinking about a dedicated YouTube content strategy, uh, and also the merits of different formats like live, shorts, and podcasting. And I think what Tabitha said there is absolutely key. You know, thinking about combining long and short form, you can think about your short form driving people to your long form. You can also think that potentially they are reaching very, very different audiences. And so there are absolutely merits in exploring different formats to speak to different audiences in the campaign period. You know, I know that I like certain types of formats. I'm not necessarily going to sit in front of a three hour live stream, but audiences differ in terms of their preferences. Um, and then finally, we covered community guidelines, um, ad friendly policies and, and how copyright might affect you. Most importantly, if you have a question after this session, uh, this is how to reach us. So for, you know, Google or YouTube product issues, questions, escalations, if as Ian said, you spotted content that you would like to flag to us because you think it's infringing of our policies, please get in touch and the email is ukpublicpolicy at google.com. So with that, if anyone has any questions, um, I don't think we've got anything in the Q&A, um, but please feel free to raise your hand. Um, or to pop it in the Q&A or the chat and we'll just pause for a second in case anyone wants to. Otherwise, we will wrap up and let you get on with your day. And as a, as a reminder, we have recorded this session and we will be hosting it online publicly afterwards. Um, so you'll be able to access that recording on the Google Civics uh, YouTube channel. So feel free to share it with any colleagues that you think that it could be relevant